It seems only fitting that Georgia head coach Vince Dooley serve as president of the American Football Coaches Association. As a veteran of 22 seasons of college football, he has established himself at the top of the profession in success, stature, and respect of his peers. After 22 campaigns, Dooley ranks third nationally in total coaching victories, 175, sixth in winning percentage among active coaches, 71%, and his six Southeastern Conference championships make him the only active coach in the league to have won more than one career title. And Dooley has achieved his success through the test of time. Only one major college coach has been at his present school longer than Dooley's 22 years. During the first half of the decade of the 1980s, 1980 to 85, Dooley's regular season record of 55, 9, and 2, and his overall mark since 1980 of 57, 11, and 3, ranks among the top echelon of all Division I teams. In addition, during those past five seasons, Dooley led the Bulldogs to one national championship, 1980, three Southeastern Conference titles, 1980, 81, and 82, and Vince has taken his teams to six major bowl games, three Sugars, one Cotton, one Florida Citrus, and one Sun. He was named NCAA Coach of the Year by every major poll in 1980. Vince is discussing that everyone has the will to win but more importantly, winners have the will to prepare. Vince Dooley. The will to prepare to win. We all have the will to win, but winners have the will to prepare. In a football sense, it's easy to have the will to win on game day. There is a crowd in the stadium. Your parents, friends, girlfriends, and the press and television crews are there. The bands are playing, flags are flying, and the cheerleaders are on the sidelines. Under those circumstances, most everybody has the will to win. But usually the individual or the team that has not paid the price to prepare stands little chance of winning. Most all fans and sports enthusiasts, after watching an individual or a team win a championship game, automatically attribute the success to the raw talent of the individual or the team. Little thought is ever given to the fact that there are many talented athletes and teams, but what separates the true winners from the also-ran is the utilization of talent through preparation and hard work. There are countless numbers of athletes blessed with talent that never achieve success because they refuse to pay the price. There is no such thing as born winners. Winning comes through persistence and long hours of work. One of the most remarkable athletes I have ever had the privilege of having on my team was Herschel Walker, who was a three-time consensus All-American and Heisman Trophy winner. I have never known an athlete with such a splendid combination of speed and strength. He was a world-class sprinter with an almost perfectly built body in the range of 6'2", 220 pounds. The normal reaction of most everyone who watched him perform is a sense of amazement at this superbly talented athlete. Yes, the good Lord blessed Herschel Walker with talent, but some unusual circumstances at an early age caused this superior individual to acquire an intense work habit that enabled him to develop to the fullest his wonderful gifts. Herschel Walker was born and reared in the small town of Riceville, Georgia, where less than a handful of athletes had ever gone to college to participate in sports. Normally in such a small town, a gifted athlete like Herschel Walker would have stood head and shoulders above the other athletes. But it so happened that in Herschel's class that particular year, there were a few other youngsters that could run as fast or faster than Herschel. Also, Herschel's sister, who was a year older and later ran track in college, could run much faster than her younger brother. This was frustrating to young Herschel Walker, but in the long run was a blessing in disguise. Because Herschel had the strong desire to be successful and because he learned at an early age that success would not come easy, he learned early on the great value of hard work for success. 
frustrated by his inability to be as fast or as strong as his oldest sister and some of his classmates, he sought advice from his high school coach on how to become faster and stronger. Because of lack of facilities at this small high school in Wrightsville, the head coach gave him the best advice under the circumstances. He told him that if he wanted to be faster, he had to run and run and run. He told him to sprint, and every time he sprinted to drive himself to be faster than the sprint before. He also told him to do push-ups for strength, and on each occasion to try and do more push-ups than the time before. This was all the advice necessary, for young Herschel Walker had a tremendous desire to excel and be the best. Herschel spent countless hours over the years sprinting and each time trying to get faster. He challenged his friends and his older sister almost daily trying to win. In fact, there was a period of time when he raced the family horse on a daily basis in order to increase his speed. Finally, he was able to win from his friends, his sister, and finally the horse, who was, of course, not a thoroughbred. He drove himself to be stronger with the same sense of commitment. Day after day, he did push-ups, all kinds of push-ups, regular front push-ups, backward push-ups, push-ups with people on his back, one-hand push-ups, each day trying to do more than the previous day until he built a routine of four to 500 push-ups a day. This training program eventually led Herschel Walker to become perhaps the combination fastest, strongest football player in the history of the game. The early competition that he experienced taught him the great value of self-discipline that in order for him to excel and be successful, he had to develop the will to prepare himself through practice and hard work. It is interesting that Herschel Walker later wrote a book on his training program, and most of his techniques consist of the fundamentals he used as a youngster growing up in Wrightsville, Georgia. This one story of one athlete having the drive and determination to prepare to win that resulted in extraordinary success is a base formula for success in any field. In fact, a recent study of 120 top artists, athletes, and scholars concluded that drive and determination in other words, the will to prepare. Not great natural talent led to their extraordinary success. We expected to find tales of great natural gifts, said University of Chicago education professor Benjamin Bloom, who led the team of researchers who studied the careers of America's top performers in six fields, concert pianists, Olympic swimmers, sculptors, tennis players, mathematicians, and research neurologists. We didn't find that at all. In fact, their mothers often said it was their other child who had the greater gift, Bloom said. The most brilliant mathematicians often said they had trouble in school and were rarely the best in their classes. Some world-class tennis players said their coaches viewed them as being too short to ever be outstanding. And the Olympic swimmers remembered getting regularly clobbered in races as 10-year-olds. The foundation-supported research team conducted in-depth interviews with the top 20 performers in the six fields as judged by national championships or similar honors. They also interviewed families and teachers hoping to learn how these individuals develop into extraordinary performers. Instead, the researchers heard accounts of an extraordinary drive and dedication through which, for example, a child would practice the piano several hours daily for 17 years to gain his goal of becoming a concert pianist. A typical swimmer would tell of getting up at 5.30 every morning to swim two hours before going to school and then two hours after school to gain his or her goal of making the Olympic team. On a more personal note, an artist friend of mine by the name of Lamar Dodd, who will one day go down as one of the great American artists, told me 
of his story of success. He said when he went to New York City to study art at an early age that he had no more raw talent than anybody else in his art class. He told me that the reason he became a great artist and rose to the top of his class was that he paid a greater price than his fellow students by outworking them. He said that when the art professor told the class to draw 10 sketches of a particular painting, that he would draw 100 or 10 times more sketches than his fellow students, which enabled him to better perfect each drawing. I was fascinated with the term he used at the time, paying the price. When he told me that many years ago, I naively thought that was a term that applied only to athletic success. He was the first to enlighten me that paying the price or having the will to prepare to win is fundamental to extraordinary success in any field. You may ask the question, does this also apply in the business world? And the answer is an emphatic yes. It's easy to have the will to win when you are making a sale or making the big presentation to a decision-making group. I suppose you call those occasions game day. But if you aren't fully prepared to answer every conceivable question, if you haven't fully analyzed the needs of the people you're talking to, if you haven't gone over all of this a hundred times to make absolutely sure it's right, your chances of success aren't very good. A few years ago, we started to make plans to fulfill a dream of building a unique athletic complex that would take us well into the next century. This complex was very important to our program for it would combine a much needed football facility with much needed office space for coaches and administrators and a hall of fame section of the building to preserve and enrich our great athletic heritage. Designing this building was going to be a great challenge, not only because of its importance and uniqueness, but because it had to be built in a limited area next to the practice fields with difficult terrain consisting of a solid granite hill described by one architect as Little Stone Mountain. It was obvious that the architect that wanted this project had to do his homework and possess a strong will to win the contract over his competitors. Our committee set aside a full day to let several architects make their presentation in pursuit of the project. Each firm made good cases for their organization getting the project, but there was one that stood head and shoulders above the others. It was obvious that the firm we awarded the project to had prepared to win. They went the extra mile in preparing a preliminary design that turned the difficult shaped terrain into an advantage for the building. They had walked the granite hill, took pictures, visualized the placement and general shape of the building, and sold us they not only wanted the project more than the others, but would do the best job. They had demonstrated a strong will to prepare to win, which enabled them to win the project. We have seen how having the will to prepare to win is paramount to extraordinary success in any field, but what specifically are some of the techniques in preparation for success in football or athletics? Two essential work areas of preparation are fundamentals and conditioning. Every successful athlete has worked to become proficient in the fundamentals of his or her game. Every day, an aspiring athlete must practice ways to develop good form. A tennis player must practice hitting hundreds and hundreds of ground strokes, both forehand and backhand, each day to perfect the base fundamentals of the game of tennis. The same is true of the fundamentals of every sport. You win with fundamentals, and consequently, every day, hard, tedious work practicing fundamentals must be accomplished. It is also important that the fundamentals of one's weaknesses be practiced twice as much as the fundamentals of one's strengths. It is much easier to work on our strength than on our weakness, but the road to success is not easy. Long, tedious hours of practice with little or any personal satisfaction is part of preparing to win. As I heard someone say, 
There is no glory in the preparation of winning, but you can have the glory without paying for it first. No athlete can be successful without a superbly conditioned body trained to face the stress of the fourth quarter or the last minutes of any contest. Superior conditioning has long been the winning edge in many contests, often allowing an inferior skill team to beat a superior skill team because they took control of the game in the fourth quarter. One of the most unifying and moving experiences this country has ever known in an international athletic contest happened several years ago in the Winter Olympics when our ice hockey team captured the gold medal after two dramatic come from behind upsets on national television over the Russians and the Finnish teams. They outscored both of those obviously better skilled teams almost four to one in each second half because they were in much better physical condition. Every athlete or athletic team will lose or suffer setbacks, which can be a great learning experience. Such adversity can excite individuals or teams to greater performance in the future. Losing when an individual or team has done its best is far more palatable than losing because an opponent was in better shape. That is the most difficult of all defeats. There are a lot of effective conditioning programs depending on the particular sport, but suffice it to say that a good athlete is never out of shape and should carry on a good year-round conditioning program. One important part of the conditioning program is a self-disciplined list of good training rules. Every athlete, in order to perform properly, must get proper rest and eat a good, healthy diet. What is even more important is the ability of an athlete to say no to temptation, from peer pressure to partake of alcohol and drugs. The athlete that can deny his or herself such pressures that promises of physical and mental pleasures will have a superior edge over those that can't say no. I heard Herschel Walker, who has never taken either drugs or alcohol, explain, why should I put anything into my body that will harm it? I need my body to be at its best for me to perform at my best. The last important part in developing the will to prepare to win is a technique called visualization. Our minds don't know the difference between real and imagined experiences, so a person can practice his assignment over and over again by visualization. Many of the great golfers in the world, like Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, Ben Hogan, and many others, visualize every shot of a round several times before they actually played the round itself. O.J. Simpson and Herschel Walker, two great Heisman Trophy winners and great running backs, both visualized themselves carrying the football hundreds of times before they ever carried the ball in a game. In conclusion, let me remind you that we all have the will to win, but true winners have the will to prepare. It is not God-given talent alone that assures success in athletics or in any field, but the utilization of that talent through hours and hours of hard work that assures extraordinary success. Persistence and the will to work by paying a higher price than your opponent is the real formula for success. The fundamentals of any sport must be practiced until they are perfected. When practicing, work on your weaknesses twice as much as you work on your strengths. Superior conditioning is the winning edge in any athletic competition. Never get out of shape. Develop a year-round conditioning program. Never take anything into your body that will harm it. If you can imagine and visualize what you want, it can be yours. There is a great price to pay for success with long and tedious hours of practice. There is no glory in the preparation for winning, but you can have the glory without paying for it first. You can achieve whatever you want 
if you work hard enough.